story of Jesus is the greatest story ever told that helped shape Western culture. Teacher, leader, savior. Lazarus, come on. Okay, enough of that. That's from the History Channel. It's a documentary, of course, on Jesus. They run it every year around Easter. And it's a way to try and attach some history to the whole Jesus thing in a way that really isn't very historical. And that whole topic is particularly relevant to today's show. I mean, that's what today's show is about. I have a Christian history smackdown with a guy I really like and respect, attorney turned author and investigative researcher, journalist, William Ramsey, who was nice enough to kind of indulge me in this dialogue about this history. Here's a clip. The most uh, quoted and referenced Christian thinker who knew Peter and all those other people, right? So uh, that's also another kind of problem with the Josephus kind of view of the Gospels being, you know, a pure political document. But there's some other elements within Christianity that don't comport with the kind of super, superficial, surface kind of uh, generalized doctrines that Christians and non-Christians uh, perceive as being what Christianity is about. Yeah, I just that winds up sounding a lot like gobbledygook to me. I mean, there yeah, is no, yeah. just because there is no, you know, you can cherry pick out of Paul and no I can question. cherry pick out of Buddha. And I mean, again, the, the part about Christianity that I think a lot of us sit back and go, how are you even processing that is to say, there's this special time. There's this special time 2000 years ago. Well, what about all the people that came before? Welcome to Skeptica, where we explore controversial science and spirituality with leading researchers, thinkers, and their critics. I'm your host, Alex Sikaris. Today, we welcome William Ramsey back to Skeptico. William is an attorney, researcher, and author, and uh, the creator of William Ramsey Investigates, which I think is fantastic. It's one of my go-to podcasts that I always listen to. And William was on a while back, and we had just a great conversation. I learned so much. And if you know this show, you know, one of the things that's really influenced me on is this kind of deeper understanding of what's going on in this crossover occult reality, Hollywood, wink, nod, and conflicting that or contrasting that, I should say, with kind of the atheistic, secular wokeness. Well, none of that stuff could be true. So we had this super interesting conversation last time, and the books that he's written, Children of the Beast, his book about Aleister Crowley, uh, Abomination, about the West Memphis Three, which is really kind of an interesting dive, and especially since so many people just don't know the facts of that case, but you do now that I've hammered on them for so many times. And then the prophet of evil, Aleister Crowley, 9-11 and the new world order. Is there anything else that you've written since then? Well, I've done a lot lot of uh, kind of letters. You can see it on my blog, on my website. I've talked a lot about this group called the order of nine angles. So more kind of occultism and uh, so some interesting topics. Is that going to make its way into a book? Is that an upcoming book or anything? Well, maybe. I mean, I think there's a lot going on. There's actually been the NCTC, the National Counterterrorism Center, put out a flyer saying that Order of Nine Angles is a very uh, dangerous group. And some of their offshoots have been prescribed. It just happened last week in Australia where Sonnen Creek Division, which has been influenced by some of their ideology, was actually banned as a group in Australia. So they have like 16 band groups and then Sonnen Creek Division, which is kind of uh, esoteric or occult neo-Nazi. So uh, yeah, the Order of Nine Angles is a pretty interesting post-Crowley, post-Hitler kind of new religion. So I've kind of been researching that and uh, writing about that and have done some interviews about that as well. I've heard a couple of your interviews on that. It's you know, super interesting at one level and in another level. And what I was hoping to do in this interview is kind of 
crawl way up on top of all that stuff if we can, because that's what really interests me is how does this stuff really fit together? And, and you know, let me back up and, and actually say one other thing, because the reason I wanted to talk to you about the really big picture stuff is I wanted to approach the Christian part of this. And I wanted to do it in a way that kind of appeals to this kind of attorney, better call Saul sensibility, if you will, that I get from you, you know, like you can talk about all this stuff. Like last time we talked about West Memphis three and you didn't get emotional, like pounding on the table and, you know, swinging a Bible around or anything like that. You're just like, Hey, I've seen a lot of stuff. I know a lot of stuff happens. Here's how the facts fall in this case. And, uh, you know, what I do with it is kind of another issue, but I can separate that from just kind of understanding. Do you get what I mean? That better call Saul? I think so. That... I, think so. I think that, you know, my look into the West Memphis Three, the, what sparked my interest was that Crowley was brought up at trial, right? So I'd already written a book about Crowley, it's basically a bio about Crowley, which is prophet of evil. He thought of himself as a prophet of the new age. So when Crowley popped up, then it was kind of like a, a riddle wrapped in enigma in the middle of a labyrinth trying to figure out what the actual truth of what happened in the West Memphis Three actually was. And luckily, all of those court cases are available online, so I could act, readily access them. And the, the general consensus was that they were railroaded and they were three innocent kids. And it was there was kind of like nice uh, uh, sound bites and PR tidbits for the public to ingest. And I it believed it for me when I first heard they got out and it's almost been 10 years, I figured that there was just some kind of mistrial or some kind of problem with the case that necessitated their release. But that wasn't the case. So then it was like a lot of head. Come on, Keith. Then it was like a lot, of, a lot of head scratching to try to figure out what was going on with that case. In my position and opinion of that case and the conclusions that I made are definitely not um, publicly popular. You know, I think that they're they're never and and like many other stories or many other things that happen in the world, the kind of darker and deeper elements of that were overlooked and not emphasized in the media or by the corporate media or anything like that. And I think that uh, that's actually very common in all of their kind of superficial analysis of a lot of problems and issues. And 9-11 is a perfect example of that, is not looking into deeper things. So from a, if you want to get into the Christian perspective, I think it's important to kind of parse through my version of Christianity, which is really a Bible Christian. I don't know myself a Protestant or a Catholic. Uh, some people would want to put me in those two groups, but as a Bible believing Christian, I think that you have to kind of, yeah, I think it's easier to see kind of darker or be more attuned to picking up darker currents in criminal events or just general political events. So, I mean, we can talk about the 2020 election, the problems with that. I mean, so from a Christian perspective, I think that it is a definitely a spiritual perspective. I think that it makes you more attuned to kind of parse out these things that really are real. Some of these people, people do believe in Alistair Crowley. People are Masons. People have secret agendas. There are conspiracies. I mean, all politics is conspiratorial. I would argue from the beginning of time in any society. So, uh, yeah. So, I mean, I think that that's really kind of the gist of my books, really. And if you look at Children of the Beast, too, that really was an attempt to take a very broad angle lens at political and cultural events and see, hey, some of these people have occult ideas. Some of these people are promoting whatever their occult kind of in, uh, outlook is in uh, in the public, Timothy Leary, Crowley himself. So um, I hope that kind of answers what you were trying to get at. It maybe does, and it maybe opens up the door for this kind of next level stuff that we might talk about. Because when I said this, uh, Jimmy McGill, better call Saul sensibility, what I think about, and if people don't have a reference point for that Netflix series, then you might be lost in this whole kind of thing. But I just have to believe when I first talked to you, you know, you talked about your history as an attorney coming up in D.C. and just being 
eyes wide open kind of thing where it's like, oh, wow, you know, there's this whole other reality of how things really work. And all these people that I'm working with are kind of living in both realities. They're living in the reality of how politics is really parapolitics. It's all conspiratorial. It's all, you know, who's blackmailing who, who has the goods on who, who has leverage on who. And then who's an agent, right? Who's like yeah. a member of a police state, a secret society, secret group. Absolutely. Right. So so they're living in that reality. And then they're simultaneously living in this other reality, which is all the normies. And normies just didn't happen in the last 10 years. Normies have been around forever. So when he went home and he kissed the wife and, you know, went out and played ball with the kids, you don't talk about any of that stuff. You don't talk about any of that stuff with 90 the people, 90 percent of the people you know if you're an insider in DC. And I think the reason I've referenced it back to Better Call Saul is we kind of get that same thing from kind of Jimmy McGill, who's just I relate from being, you know, a, a kid from Chicago and in Chicago, you want to be a sharp guy. You know, you don't want to be a chump. You don't want to be a fool. And that was part of less like, of course, this is how things work. Of course, the political system is corrupt. Everyone in Chicago knows that, you know, Richard J. Daly electing, you know, John Kennedy. Of course, of course, the, the entire police okay. system is corrupt. I mean, anyone who didn't know that in Chicago there were a lot of people that didn't know it, but they were just kind of on the outside. So you get what I'm saying in terms of that sensibility and you bring that to the table. And, but then there's a couple of different ways to divide that. So, you know, one, you're talking about just stuff that happens. It's 9-11 or the 2020 election, or the pandemic and all that sort of thing. Okay. But then you're also breaking it down on the spiritual side, which is where, I think it's kind of a harder for a lot of us when we encounter, when you say I'm a, a Christian or I'm not Catholic, Protestant, I'm just Bible. But it's like, whoa, wait a minute. Isn't that the same kind of thing in terms of how are you parsing no. that reality? <laughs> right. No, I mean, it's a good question. I think it's like once you're even within Christendom, it's like, what are you like? What, how much do you believe? How much have you read? What, uh, what books are you reading? What's your denomination? You know, you can say that there's four or five major Christian denominations. Um, so there's only one. It all started from one. Right. I mean, there were well, I, this is true, but there's definitely branches. I think in almost any major religion, even Judaism, which is fairly small compared to, you know, Christ, the large broad tent of Christianity or Islam, all have variants and distinctions and Shia and Sunni, Christianity is Catholic and Protestant at a very general level. So it's really what you believe. What are these people teaching you? Or do you go back to the original text? And I think that that's really the key element to really understanding Christianity is really to go to the original gospels, the four, the three there, synoptic there are gospels. No, there general. are no original, there are no well, original gospels. I mean, if we just, well, from, a his, from a straight up historical standpoint, and that's what I'm saying, it's like, right. what are you going to do? Well, go back to the Council of Nicaea and Constantine, who is one of the most corrupt, despicable people in history. You know, he murders his son because he thinks she, he's right. fucking his wife, and then he murders his wife when he finds out she well, he, said him. I mean, this is the most despicable... Yeah, he's a very opportunistic Christian, right? So no, he's, he's, he's not a Christian. Very political. He's, That's what he came out as. I mean, he's supposed to be a founder of the Christian church or like one of the original. At well, least no, he, but he's not, William. He's he's not. I mean, any any kind of fair reading of that history, he, he never really changes his kind of cultish pagan, you know, I mean, he still has it on the coins and he still, it's it's just it just looks like a total sham. The part of that history that I don't understand that Christians don't get is that we're all living rich, complicated spiritual lives, and they show up all over the place. For Damian Eccles from West Memphis 3, we, we don't know what his deal is, but we know he has a rich spiritual life and he's trying to connect with Aleister Crowley and demons and this and that, but he probably is also waking up at two o'clock in the morning going, oh my God, you know, what is this going to do to my soul? Because everyone has those same 
kind of questions. Constantine certainly doesn't look like Saint Constantine. Looks like a very human guy, you know, who's uh, worried about his wife fucking around, worried about his son fucking around. I mean, he doesn't look like he's uh, had some great spiritual experience with Jesus to me. Well, he might, but I mean, at least the, the common historical story is that he was going into battle and then it's bullshit. You know, change. Well, that's what I'm saying. Well, at least that that is that the story is that that is how he became a Christian. So therefore, he was one of the founders of that, at least at 3000, one of the political founders of Christianity. But I, I don't I don't see him as like a great religious figure, not like maybe some of these other post like Paul, for example, but uh, at least that's the way he's regarded, I think, in public, Constantine. But I like, I, I agree. I think that he w- there's tons of people who say they're Christians who operate without adhering to the fundamental tenets. And that's the same from all religions. I would actually posit and argue that a lot of these political, at least in the United States, for sure, these guys who, run, who are the presidents, they just give lip service to Christianity. They don't really believe it. They How shouldn't believe it because it's not it's not real. It's just something that was invented. Okay, well, that's your opinion. So you think that the Gospels themselves were something written by what, Flavian or some kind of, uh, that's the argument? Here's where I'm coming at from that. Okay. Is like, I come at it back to where we started. Like, you know, you, wanna, you don't want to be a chump, right? That's the sure. better call Saul sensibility. Right. So when somebody tells you, you know, hey, those guys in West Memphis Three, <laughs> they're really great guys who just got railroaded out of town for wearing black T-shirts. And then you read in and you come across the data one after another after another, and you start putting the pieces together. You go, well, that's just bullshit. I don't know what the truth is. Like I'm saying, I don't know okay. what Damien Eccles' spiritual experience, spiritual reality is. Right. But I'm pretty sure it ain't what he said it is. So that's where well, I that, that's where I he's come at written it from. some stuff about it. Sure. So I think you're trying to make an analogy between the if, the perception of reality based upon what people have about Damien Eccles and then about Christianity. So like you're you're making a commitment to not be a chump and believe in Christianity. Is that correct? Where I was really going was so if you don't want to be a chump then right. where do you start, you know? And like one of the places I'd start is like that history that I just said, for any Christian who can't resolve that history, you know, full stop. You better go figure out what the fuck, why you believe in this church that was founded by Constantine when Constantine was this kind of despicable mover and shaker kind of total agent of some kind of cult thing so that that because hey, we you both can kind go of, through the history of christianity the same thing look at the catholic church or alexander the sixth i'm just the saying popes are, right the popes are I, I, right. not clean right so i'm look just saying the, i'm like, just hey, saying as a catholic christian church today right as a christian i would think that would be something because i was brought up christian i was brought up greek, greek orthodox like right. so a lot of people brought up in the church and then they start running into these kind of things and they feel a need to resolve them but the, the other way, to, so that's one thing. I think you have to, as a Christian, you have to resolve the history, and the history is irresolvable. I mean, you can't jump. Right. can't it's true, jump. but you have to look at it. No question. I don't think there's any doubt about that. So, the, so then the Crusades are loaded, you know? The Crusades are loaded with tons of problems. They were real. Mine, the Crusades, I think the last Crusade was really kind of a population control crusade where they wanted to take the excess population out of Europe and ship them out somewhere. So they took all the poor people and got rid of them. So it really wasn't really even having anything to do with uh, Muhammad or the Muslims. So there's a lot of things within Christianity. I mean, you can look at the Hundred Years' War between the Protestants and the Catholics or just some of the most brutal non-Christian conflicts ever and tons of, you know reasons for the creation of the United States and all this other stuff. A lot of it came out of these cons- conflicts within these churches. So uh, there's a lot of problems and a lot of the Christian problems, like justifications for racism, slavery, are the people who reference the Bible. So there's a lot of problems there. It doesn't, It's. I think you can differentiate it from the original texts and the original gospels, but some people can't. I, I don't have a problem doing that. 
I mean, I think that that's really it. So some people can apply to me or just general Christians, hey, look what the Catholic Church has done. If you reject that, then how can that affect your concept of the original, you know, gospel texts? Well, because, I mean, the argument, and then we can let it go, because there's other more interesting stuff to talk right. about, is okay. there is no original Right. Okay. Soon, well, that, that's where you and I are have a, I will respect it, you can't even myself. you you can't even I mean, that's I don't know how you can argue that. I mean, again, uh, sure. what, well, what I we mean, have, here, here's another thing. If you want to look at history, we know that I think was it Eusebius knew somebody who knew Peter in Rome. So these people who have met Paul, they're in the history texts. These are legit history texts that people knew these people existed. And these are outside of apocryphal texts. These are like legit biblical text. So I think that kind of uh, the idea that the Gospels were invented 2,000 years out of whole cloth have a lot of problems. And also, there's tons but of I'm arguments. I'm not saying for... that. I'm not saying, okay. I'm not saying the, I don't the Gospels know. Okay. were well, invented out of whole cloth. Okay. I mean, okay. what, what, what it looks like, I mean, what do you do with the Nag Hammadi Library? I mean, right. You, you just can't, you can't resolve that with quote unquote, the gospels, right? Because what you have is this, all this collection of writings and all these right. different translations and all these different historical accounts without even getting into the problem of Josephus, you know, which is enormous because he's just completely a propaganda agent for the Romans. So you just look at that. I'm saying from a big picture, you just step back and you say, okay, there's some history there. Right. But I cannot. Well, get... Josephus isn't the only history. So, I mean, if you're looking through it through the lens of merely Josephus, who actually had a kind of an admirable reference, I think one full paragraph about Jesus, about he was a miracle worker and a great man. And... Yeah, that, that so, reference but, I mean, absolutely, can... that, a, that reference is okay. absolutely inconsistent with the body of his, you know. I agree with that. It actually stands out. It's like an aside. His real interest is the history of the Jews. And if, I so mean, it, it was probably an interpolation. It was probably something later on that someone added in because Josephus was the guy. So let's have him say this stuff about Jesus. I mean, that's the, right. the, the natural conclusion, I guess, if you're going to be at all, if you're going to well, be the sharp, better call Saul guy, you're going to get, hey, maybe. <clears throat> I don't think maybe. so. I don't agree with you. I don't agree with you at all. I think that you're saying that some you're just assuming that somebody in history went in and re-edited Josephus's text. That's the that's evidence? the general consensus yeah. among people. Well, general who, consensus of who? Of people who've really well again. So look, like I'm saying, like we can't argue that. People argue that all the time and get to what I'm just saying is from a from a this is how the world works, it's conspiratorial standpoint. To me, that's not even a hard one. Because you look at all of Josephus's writings, they would all be completely inconsistent with that one paragraph. That one paragraph, right. if that if he wrote that, you could throw out the thousands well, and thousands well, of other pages well, that he wrote. On. Well, I disagree with that too, because he wrote the history of the Jews, which a lot of it's very consistent with Old Testament history. And they talked a lot about people who um, we know from history, all the Roman emperors and the uh, who was it? Uh, Justin? Who was it? Who was it? Who was the Flavians? It was uh, Titus well, and his father. It was so a lot Vespasian, of the stuff is Vespasian. It was Vespasian, Vespasian, right. and then Titus, and then Domitian, and, and yeah, right. But but I mean, you have all that stuff earlier. I mean, they found. I think they've even found um, Pontius Pilate's name in in Latin in in somewhere in Judea. So I mean, there's references there that keep popping up that kind of verify some of that story that's told in the gospels, right? Yeah, but it's, okay. I mean, again, if you don't see, if you don't see Josephus as completely a propaganda agent for the Romans, it, it you, you just haven't read Josephus. Cause like when I well, said, I have you, read Josephus, I have read Josephus. I've actually recorded some stuff. With Josephus, I know, but I, I don't see him. Uh, he's obviously a, a, a house Flavian, like his di he's part of that dynasty. Of course, he's going to tell the story of the Romans from the Roman perspective. And he actually, I mean, do you think that the, like what he retells of him giving a speech to the uh, Jerusalem inhabitants who are, who have been captured with, by the Romans, by a huge 
you know, blockade. Do you think that that's all fake? Once somebody is shown to be fake, once somebody is shown to be an agent, a disinformation agent, then I, I just don't know why we would follow him and try and parse out, you know, what's true and what's not. He's clear, you know, here's the, here's the, I can't believe, uh, uh, <laughs> I've said this to so many people, so many Christians, they've never really read uh, Josephus. Let me pull it I up. I have. Here. I'm telling you, I've read Josephus. Well, I haven't read the full history of the Jews, but I've heard, I've read the history of the wars of the Jews, which was, you know, the whole retelling of the sacking of Jerusalem in 70 AD. So let me uh, pull up what I sent you. So this is uh, War of the Jews. Josephus is one of his first bestsellers, 6.5.4. So he says, but what more? Then all else incited them to war, that is, incited the Jews to war, was an ambiguous oracle, likewise found in their sacred scriptures, to the effect that at the time one from their country would become ruler of the world. He's talking this kind of third person about the Jews, of which he is one. He not only is one, but he claims to be kind of a super Jew. And by that, he said, I was so... Jewish from the time that I was brought up, and I was so learned in the law that at 14 years old, I went to the temple and I was, you know, kind of talking right. down to the guys in the temple and telling them what's up, you know. Of course, this is his account, which is completely ridiculous. And it is also, they, even that point, you know, if you talk to Jews who are really scholarly about this, they'll say, well, this, he, contradicts himself because later in his writings, he doesn't seem to know the law very well, the Jewish law. So he isn't the super Jew that he says. But anyways, here is his big pronouncement. He says, you know what really incited these Jews? You know what really drove them crazy was that there was this sacred scripture that told them that at some time, someone would rise up from their ranks and become ruler of the world. And here's what he says. It's important. The oracle, however, in reality, signified the sovereignty of Vespasian, right? Who we're just saying is the, the Roman right. general who's just kicking their ass and killing them and becomes Caesar, who was proclaimed emperor on Jewish soil. So he says, here's Josephus saying, you know what? I'm a super Jew, so trust me. But here's how our whole thing, here's how our whole religious tradition is based. We, we had it all wrong. It really wasn't about the Messiah. It was about Vespasian. And where we, where we went wrong was in reading the oracle, because what it did, what the oracle didn't see is that when he was proclaimed emperor, which is just kind of a little subtle fact that he was proclaimed emperor in Rome, but he was on Jewish soil. And that's how he kind of is trying to sell this grand conspiratorial nonsense to his Jewish people that that's what makes him the guy. This is so clearly a uh, bullshit propaganda. I, I just. Right. Yeah, but so I mean, Josephus, I, don't you think. So Josephus is out the window. You can't, you, you can never use Josephus again. He's completely an agent yeah. of the Romans. Well, I agree with that. But I think that you have to look at everything in context. I think you're in context is important, but it's also kind of a logical fallacy. If somebody is writing something that everything else that they have ever written is null and void. I mean, it's kind of like extra extrapolation from one well, issue. It's not I, I, so, I mean, I think that a lot of his stuff, at least the history of the Jews, comports and follows Old Testament writings, right? I mean, he's talking about Moses. He's talking about Abraham. He, he retells the story of, uh, you know, I think Genesis. So... Uh, from a different perspective. But, but will you, this, this, man, see, like, this is what gets back to the first part of what we're saying. It's like you're in D.C. And you're now being woken up to how this shit works, right? Well, of course, 90% of it sound, is, 90% of it is totally logical and flies, right? It's the, the edges. It's the Vince so Foster case that you're talking about. I mean, 90% of it looks legit. 
except oh they forgot to put the gun in the in the correct in hand and hand it hand doesn't fly out of the it's not like the whole thing is just completely made up you only <laughs> need to make up 10 percent of it and you don't if you make up right. if you make up the whole thing it's exposed as a fraud so it's just 10 percent <laughs> okay <laughs> okay you're saying that because josephus had problems that you're noticing therefore the whole story of the gospels is a lie is that what you're kind of intimating well well slow down here for a okay. second well let's get this i mean that's what well, no slow like down for across. a second because so, this is right, you know, see this is like one of those things this is like what what would drive you crazy um right. like it's about because like it's, it's right what we believe what we believe right so so like here <laughs> it is but it goes back to the West Memphis three case, right? Hey, they didn't retry those guys. So obviously they, they didn't, they, they didn't do, obviously that. they didn't do their, they obviously they didn't re, they didn't do the crime. Well, that's what you, I mean, right. I know what you're saying. <laughs> I get it, but they are still guilty of law. I think their uh, probation ends in August of this year, but yeah, I mean, they're guilty of law. Right. They could get retried. They, I mean, the they federal, got off. They got yeah. they got let out of prison. They don't let people out of prison. If these guys really, yeah, but they signed on the dotted line that they were uh, that they there's enough evidence for them to have a conviction of first degree murder. So no, they, they let them out. It. They let them out. No, no, they didn't. I'm no, they saying, didn't. man, you get what I'm saying. I know. Well, yeah, I think that you're kind of you're the approach that you're taking to christianity is through josephus therefore all of the core texts that were there whether it's the writings of paul and the original gospels are we're not getting to that we're not talking about okay. that we're just well, talking I, I about think that's what you're insinuating and that because that's what you're saying about like how you're applying my my view of you know, DC, how like you could have the scales fall from your eyes and see things differently when you're there up close. Where I was really trying to get to, and, and we will get there eventually, is that spirituality is real. And we're in this strange situation, which is something we would agree with. And then your spirituality is different than my spirituality. Here's what's super interesting, I think, and important about your work and what comes through again and again, and where it intersects with kind of my worldview and, and what I've been pounding on, is that the denial of uh, spirituality, the denial of the idea that each of us has this rich, spiritual, non-physical experience is part of the agenda. And it's part of the agenda that comes up again and again with, you know, the postmodern, you can't really believe anything, the wokeness, the, it comes in with the scientific, Luciferian, you know, merge with the machine, right. you really have no soul. Communism, kind of you could say that too, communitarianism. It is an agenda. It's an opiate. It yeah. is a, it is what's being sold. It's a social engineering project. Because yes, if I can true. separate you from your spirituality, then man, you are easier to control, right? You Absolutely. are not a, you are not an infinite spiritual being. You're just freaking a biological you're, robot. You're yeah, the worse. You're just an accident of time and space, right? That's all that all, the, the whole evolutionary outlook is that you're just a random event in a series, random uh, cosmos, right? So there's, there's two, so to me, this is kind of my worldview, is that there's two steps to this. Well, there's many steps to it, but one step is that, you know, one, one way that I can kind of get to you is to separate you from your spirituality and convince you that you really don't have a spirituality. You right. are, what did you say, an accident of time and space, you know, you are right. A, right. a biological robot Random. in this universe, as yeah, I always right. put it. Right. But then the, the second, uh, point, I guess, that I'm driving towards is that if that doesn't work, the next thing that I can do is take your genuine spiritual experience and then try and co-opt it. And I see religion as a way of co-opting it, right? So you have a genuine spiritual very experience. very general sense. I agree with that, 100%. So you have a, gen, you know, William Ramsey has a spiritual life 
And his spiritual life is a direct connection with Christ consciousness, if you will allow that, you know, but I totally accept that you are having a spiritual experience with this thing. And I'm just putting that label on it, Christ consciousness. And that I don't, I don't, I hold loosely the connection with that and the historical Jesus. I'm not saying it's not there, but I'm saying it isn't necessarily as kind of detailed. It has to fit perfectly in order for your spiritual experience to still be valid. And here's where I'm trying to head with that. Because the reason I put it together that way is primarily because of like when I went looking for this, I went looking for the science and the best science I found is near-death experience. So with near-death experience, people are dead. They no longer have that brain. They no longer have that biological robot thing. And they are now they are infinitely more connected to the spiritual. And there's plenty of people that are super connected with Christ consciousness in that realm and all sorts of different levels of Christ consciousness, but some like literal, you know, I touch the hands, the blood kind of thing, which I don't know what to make of that, but I, I accept that. I would say it's a false interpretation of, of what gospels it's well, it's obviously, if you look at the last supper, Passover is coming up what, tomorrow it's today, right? I mean, uh, the last supper is yes. obviously symbolic, but they've in the, within Christianity, they've made it more literal, especially the Catholic church used to be at the wafer and the wine were literal transmogrifications of blood and his body, which is deranged. Okay. So it's symbolic, it's to be symbolic. It's clearly symbolic because even in the Last Supper, he's using it as a symbol. He doesn't cut open his thumb and drop blood out. It's ridiculous. Well, I, my only point. Even the blood, the, even, I mean, we can go in, even within Christianity, people say the blood of Jesus, it's obviously a symbol. It's not the literal of Jesus. Yeah. And where I was going with that, William, is I've spoken to a number of people that have uh, verifiable near-death experiences. And by near verifiable near-death experiences, we can say all the medical conditions that they report and we can verify would suggest that they were dead, right? And then these people have these experiences and they report back having spiritual experiences that they identify as being with Christ consciousness. Now, one of the ways that I evaluate whether those experiences should be taken seriously is how they live their fucking life. If they come back and they're walking the talk and living spiritual lives and being good people. And that's what they're about is love and compassion and goodness. Then I say, hmm, that seems to be evidence <laughs> that they maybe had that good experience. Right. If they come back and they're lying, deceptive, cultish, kind of secret society people, which none I've never encountered or even heard of in the thousands of cases that have been reported. I've never heard of someone saying I went to the light after I clinically died and I came back and I decided to go do <laughs> Alistair go Crowley, you know, sex magic right. and bringing forth right. the anti. I've never zero cases of that. I think that evidence is important. And it's impenetrable to the quote Christian beliefs. Well, it's, it's well, yeah, well, uh, it depends. I mean, it depends what version of Christianity or kind of what happens when you're dead. I mean, I think the general outlook is you pass away, the resurrection, you're judged, then you go on to heaven or hell, right? So that's a very general term, but. Paul, even Paul, like we all shine on the sun, the moon, and the stars, right? That whole line or whatever it is from Lenin was taken from one of Paul's missives. So even the Mormons, they actually key into that as some kind of, uh, you know, re not resurrection, but reincarnation kind of outlook. So uh, yeah, there's a little bit, I mean, if you want to really get into like more esoteric aspects of uh, what people have written, at least Paul too is probably you know the the high the most well for sure the most uh, quoted and referenced Christian thinker who knew Peter and all those other people right so 
uh, that's also another kind of problem with the Josephus kind of view of the Gospels being, you know, pure political document. But there's some other elements within Christianity that don't comport with the kind of super, superficial surface kind of uh, generalized doctrines that Christians and non-Christians uh, perceive as being what Christianity is about. Yeah, I just that winds up sounding a lot like gobbledygook to me. I mean, there no, is no, are. just because there is no, you know, you can cherry pick out of Paul and no you can question. cherry pick out of Buddha and, you know, Buddha's 500 years before, or there's all these great spiritual people that have had these downloads. I mean, again, the, the part about Christianity that I think a lot of us sit back and go, how are you even processing that is to say, there's this special time there's this special time 2000 years ago. Well, what about all the people that came before? What about all the people in, that, that we encounter in our lives that never had any contact with that experience, uh, that Christian experience, that Christian education, and are more spiritual, we would all say, are what we aspire to be in that spiritual sense. But I don't even want to go there because all the answers are just gobbledygook. What, what, what I would kind of bring back, and, and this is an effort to try and understand the Christian perspective in a really kind of no bullshit way, which I don't think, and I appreciate you doing this, because I've never been able to have this. I'm not worried. You okay. can ask me any questions. So, more. you know, the, the next thing with, with the near-death experience, like, so number one, I, I just interviewed this guy, Bruce Grayson, who's been probably one of the most well-known near-death experience researchers, 40 years at University of Virginia, hundreds and hundreds of paper, influenced all these people. Uh, grew up in a very secular household, no belief in any of this stuff, and now believes in God and is, is able to say that after, you know, it took him a long time to be able to say, I just can't get around the evidence. But of course he isn't a Christian. Because anyone who encounters the near-death experience research, one of the things that comes through to that is there's no exclusivity. There's no Christian is right kind of Christian, the primacy of Christianity. It just does not come through in those accounts. So if you want to throw out all that research and you just want to say, well, I, I don't know, whatever they're having, it, it isn't, it's non-Christian, so I'm going to ignore it all. You're stepping over probably the best science we have for understanding the reality of spirituality. Well, I mean, I think they're stepping over is one thing. I mean, I think it, at least in Christianity, they talk about the gifts of the spirit. So people leave their bodies, they talk to uh, and whatever they derive in for in inspiration or the Holy spirit. So I think uh, some of these NDEs could be put into that context. I don't think that, uh, I mean, you, I think when you're talking, and you're talking about Christianity, you're talking about it in a very general sense, which I don't mind, but I would say my outlook is not uh, pretty independent. So, but I do believe my outlook is definitely Bible based, but. Uh, well, it, it can be Bible based. I mean, yeah, you, you can, right. you can, you can control that. But, but just let me, let me make sure I'm being I mean, clear. you can, here's even better. The death and resurrection of Jesus Christ could be seen as a near-death experience. So just let me make explicit what I'm saying. is There's thousands of near-death experience accounts at this point that have been recorded. And you can kind of study them in two ways, and you have to. First, you have to study them from a kind of physiological, neurological, medical standpoint and say, okay, were they really dead? And did they really have the experience? You know, so like one of the things they do, William, is they ask people to recall their resuscitation. Well, if your brain is out, your brain is flatlined. Your brain is not active in producing consciousness. You should not be able to recall your resuscitation. So it's kind of a good control, simple experiment to see if there really is this extended realm, right? So right. the science there confirms there is this extended realm. So that's the science on one hand. Then what you can do is start looking at the content of those experiences, right? And you can say like overwhelmingly, like 90%, what people come back and say, God, they say, you know, hey, for lack of a better term, call it light, call it love, call it whatever you want. I experienced 
I can't even call it love. There's no words for it, but I'll try and describe it to you because you want to hear it. But it's just complete acceptance, complete love, complete divinity, complete something higher. That is overwhelmingly the finding from the near-death experience literature. It's not tunnels. It's not dead right. relatives or anything like that. It's God and it's love. So that's the, the, the second finding. But the, the, in those findings, the other thing that comes through consistently, if you're going to accept that data, is there is no primary religion. There is no Christianity is the way. It just, they say no. They say there's all sorts of different ways for, to right. reach that God, to reach that divinity. And there's no special place for Christianity. If you're going to, so you can reject that and say, well, that's just bullshit. I don't, I, I know because I'm a Christian and that's what I've been taught. But if you're going to follow that data. I, well, I just, but yeah, but I, most of my reading and research into Christianity is self-taught. So nobody's really taught me anything other than myself. Right. Well, it, it, I, I wish you'd take that one step further and say, you know, you just have a direct spiritual experience because anyone who has a direct spiritual experience, like if you pray to, to Jesus or to God or whatever, and you get an answer, I'm down with that. Because to me, that's how the data reads. It's like you don't you don't need an intermediary. You, <laughs> why would you, you need, don't an, need an intermediary? You don't need an intermediary. You don't. Why would you possibly need? How I don't know know why people f fall for that. To me, that's like such a scam. It's like really, you need somebody up there that that guy up at the front who says, "Okay, give me your yeah. money, take this bread, and now I will interpret everything for you." Why would you fall right. for that? Good question. But so, here's the thing. If you ever compare like uh, Christian kind of views of people who have died and supposedly stood before God or experienced God to non-Christians or other people who have experienced NDEs and, and looked at the similarities or differences. Uh, yeah. And there's a lot of other people who have done it a lot better than I do. But the main thing that comes through that is key, I think, for Christians to I don't want to say understand because that makes it sound like I know something just to go investigate on their own is this thing about judgment because the consistency, and this is like, to me, it fits back to what we're saying about the classic way that things get co-opted. And that's why I think Christianity is a co-opted spiritual experience. And one other thing I wanted to mention was this Gregory Shushan guy, but before I get there, I don't want to bury the lead. The lead is it's completely about judgment. Every, not every act that you do, every thought that you have, everything will be judged, but you will ju judge. You will stand in judgment of yourself. Your soul will stand in judgment. And most people, as soon as they hear that, they kind of have a big sigh and they go, yeah, I kind of knew that. I kind of knew that all along. I knew that from the time I was a kid and I was tempted to take that candy from the store. And there was something inside of me that said, I should do it, or, oh, I'm really hungry, really want it, or I don't do it. It wasn't something outside of you. Some, It was you. It was your soul's journey. And so what the end of ears say is that you, when you die, you are completely supported, completely loved. And the fact that you are now going to face a judgment of what you did through your own experience, that's that's hard enough for you. We don't need to add on top of that and judge you. You judge yourself. Interesting. So, so, so according to your post death uh, view, then you will go to some place and self judge. And then what happens? Well, there's a lot of questions about what happens and there's not a lot of definitive answers, but that's where I was going to throw in this last guy, super important guy for anyone who is, interested in kind of exploring this. So I interviewed this one guy. <laughs> and there's, there's some real uh, tie-ins to the other conversation we're having, because this guy's name is Dr. Gregory Shushan. And uh, super, you know, PhD guy, Oxford guy, barely eking out a living within academia, because he's, of course, studying something spiritual, which makes him completely persona non grata. So the way he gets around it is he kind of talks out of both sides of his mouth. You know, he's talking about all these near-death experiences in other cultures. That's his work. Near-death experiences in other cultures throughout time. So he has hundreds and hundreds of year olds accounts from Polynesians, from Native Americans, South Americans, South Africans, all over the place, right? 
and he's analyzed those over time. What he's found is that in virtually every culture that he's found, the near-death experience forms the foundation of the afterlife beliefs of the group, right? And what he found that's even more interesting and confirming of it, he said in some of these kind of shamanistic cultures, they will have a belief about the afterlife. And then, you know, William will be out there and get hit by a tree and die and he'll come back and he'll say, hey, this is what happened. And it, it is such a compelling account that the shaman will go, wait, William, well, exactly. William is right. William must be right. We need to change our beliefs. It's, it's powerful research because when you go cross culture and you go cross time, you really sort out a lot of the, the wheat from the chaff kind of thing. I would agree. I mean, don't you think there's a lot of similarities in experience between different cultures that are prevented from being understood through language? Like a lot of these people have spiritual views similar to yours and things like that. They believe in the reincarnation or the afterlife or something like that. Absolutely. But I, I guess the other thing, you know, tying it back to what we're talking about is you have to consider the, the evil part of it. You know, because right. the evil part of it is the deceptive part of it is the how right. do I gain? How do I gain control of someone? How do I dominate someone? Absolutely. Look at all the religious beliefs, the teachers here that are really popular. They're worth millions of dollars. Some of them are want time like that. What was the cult you were talking about at the beginning? Which one? Order of Nine Angles? Yeah. So, again, it's a mixture of this brew of, you know, these beliefs. And then how can I kind of get in between? Right. It's right. consistently done over time, you know, whether it's Jim Jones or whether it's the Mormons, which I would throw in that category, whether oh, it's man. Scientology. It uh, Jehovah's Witnesses, Seventh-day Adventists, all say that they're right. Everyone, even if you want to look at the sects within Christianity, each one says they're correct. And then they turn the screws. The Catholic Church says we're the only true church, Right. So how could you believe in anything else? Therefore, you got to give us money. You have to pay for these priests. And then they engage in the kind of same behaviors that Christ railed against when he was in Jerusalem. So uh, what you can see is Christianity, even Judaism for that matter. A lot of those things are condemned, at least by the, the faith's founder. I think that even the structure, if you look at Christ's teachings of the original gospels, church he's outside he's talking to people in their homes they invite him to his place really the only religious uh place I mean, outside the synagogue which he got kicked out of was the temple right and that and uh you know ended disastrously people would say that there's no connection between the fall of jerusalem and christ's death and resurrection but i would say that's a direct Consequence and even kind of prophesied that, you know, no stone upon this place will live on, will be there after time. I don't remember the direct quote, but um, I, you could make a very good argument that the original Christianity as taught by Christ was not a kind of churchianity. It wasn't about these structures, but like you said, I think a lot of these people who came after him said, oh, we got to have a church and we got to have all this and you got to pay for this and we need to have a priest. So then there's priestcraft, pastor craft, and you got all kinds of problems. And that's what, uh, I mean, my read of all that is, yeah, a lot of it came before him too. There's nothing right. super special about, I mean, Jesus, as those teachings come through, are truths, are spiritual truths, and they were always accessible to everyone throughout time, because we well, all have... To be. Right. We all have a rich spiritual experience. We all have a connection with the divine. We can all know what the truth is. Everyone throughout time, 50,000 years ago, an Aborigine on the plains of Australia could access the same truths, but they could also access the same, it seems like, and we don't understand any of this stuff, and I'm not claiming I'm doing, it's just my conclusion. They could also access some of the not so great things, you right. know, and Montezuma's right. on the hill and he's tearing the hearts out of people. Right. That's before Jesus, but he's still and he's still tapping into that satanic energy that says destroy, conquer, dominate. Right. That's a good point. Absolutely.
Okay, man. Totally you've, agree with you've you. undergone the grilling. I, I, no, I, I, I'm kidding. I, don't I, I appreciate it. I don't hear these conversations enough. Well, let's do, do it again. Let's talk more about I will. I will come back with greater uh, proofs that of, I need to look at the historical proofs, but things like that. But the things that differentiates Christ's teachings from even the other so-called great, you know, teachers of uh, wisdom teachers, whether it's, you know, the Buddha, Muhammad, supposedly, uh, what is it? What was the guy who started Zoroaster? You know, some of these other teachers, even Moses. Yeah, but I mean, I think really, ultimately, if you do agree with that last thing that I said, and it sounds like you genuinely did, there's really nothing more to talk about. I mean, it's like the truth is there. The truth is available to everybody. The truth is certainly available through Jesus Christ, what I call Christ consciousness. Anyone can access it. It's not, doesn't need to be filtered through some book. If you pray to Jesus, the statistics show <laughs> four out of five people who genuinely pray for, for help from, for Jesus to do good things you know, their answer, their prayers are answered and that you can do good things. You can be a good person. You know, it's, it's not, right. and you can be an evil person too. And it doesn't depend on what you read or anything like that. It's like, you know what to do and what not to do. I don't know. It doesn't seem that complicated to me. It's you no, know, I'm thinking when you really parse it down, it's not that complicated. It really isn't that complicated, but people make it over overly complicated. It's very simple, very simple doctrines. Yeah. So I love mean, everyone I and tell I, the I, truth. Right. That's basically it. I mean, I mean, <laughs> everything that the law and prophets are based upon uh, loving your fellow man and, and loving God. That's it. It was all uh, Christ just distilled it down into two simple principles, right? Yeah. So, so I mean, why you don't have to overthink it, then you can just build on that. You can talk about first Corinthians, what is love, you can talk about these other explanations of the proper behavior for the individual. But uh, I mean, I just don't see, I guess, I guess the real distinction in like the Christian view is the primacy of Christianity overall, like it's the pearl of great price. And I think that people outside of Christianity have a real problem with that. They have a, I mean, I, I would think that they have, there's more paths to God, whereas like Christ says, I am the way, the truth, and the light. So I think that that's really a lot of the people who are outside of that very, very, very wide tent of Christianity really have a problem. Well, you could turn it around and say, I think that's the problem that Christians have. Right, right. I mean, well, if you I mean, can't, if you're a Christian and you can't see that there's unlimited paths to God, then I'm, I don't, I don't know how you're reading the data. It's back like, I just don't, like I said, go read the near-death experience accounts. Go read the near-death experience accounts and go tell me those people aren't having genuine spiritual experiences. Okay? I would, I would say off the top that they are having genuine spiritual experiences. Well, then experiences. if they're in, and, and then they're a lot, but I, like I've interviewed, like I've interviewed a ton of people. Like one guy I interviewed was the, Ian McCormick and he had an unbelievable near-death experience. I mean, this guy was dead for like, he was in the morgue in, wow. uh, in, in this little island, you know, he was swimming, he got stung by boxfish, deadly. And he was in their little makeshift morgue more for like seven hours. He had this experience and he saw Jesus, Christ consciousness. Fantastic. But he comes back, he goes around to churches all over the world and says, hey, near-death experience is real. There's an afterlife. But let me tell you, if you don't see Jesus, you didn't really have one. It was Satan faking yeah. you. It's like, fuck yeah. you, Ian. You're so full of shit. I mean, it's just a stupid interpretation of the data. It's just as crazy and as cultish as, you know, Damien Eccles sitting around thinking that, you know, the, the Antichrist is the way to go for, you know, it's just stupid. And, and that's what gets me about the, the, the Christian thing. If you can't see that it's all about love everyone and tell the truth. So, oh, of course, anyone can get there by doing that. Then I don't know what game you're playing. Yeah, I mean, if you think it's know. exclusive. If you think it's exclusive, I don't know how you, you fit that with the data. Yeah, I don't. I don't, I don't, I don't think that, yeah, I think within Christianity or, you know, the view is, is that the outs, the people outside of it are going to obtain the same blessings and benefits of being inside that wide tent. But and I that's do silly. think that's silly. Right. I, I, I mean, look at all the people who lived and 
passed away prior to the advent of Christ and look at how many people have not heard the gospel. It's hard for me to believe that there, there, there's no, it's hard for me to believe that those people are, there's not some kind of spiritual address from them, from God, you know. William, what's coming up for you? What are you going to, what are you doing I'm just nowadays? Finished. I'm just exhausted. I've been working on a project, so I'm hoping to get it done within the next week, but uh a William yeah. Ramsey so investigates you know. a William Ramsey investigates project or some other. Project. Yes. Yeah. Well, a good proper 400 page book. Really? Yeah. See, I, I pumped you at the beginning for what book you're working on. You really keep, you keep it under your hat that much. Huh? You don't, you have you don't to, say, you have to. Yeah. Why, why do you have to? Cause Cover your publisher, some... your publisher no, requires. No, it? no, no. There's all kinds of problems. People steal your ideas and there's all, you know, people claim really? stuff. Oh yeah. Oh man. Very I'll cool. Stories. I'll tell you stories off of it. Great. Okay. <laughs> it's kind so, of like a small little community. So people are always saying, this is my idea. I came up with this. Let it be known. I came up with this in this state. I, wow. So, yeah. But, but no, so, so the, the inside, the inside word is kind of keep, keep your eye on William Ramsey investigates because something big is coming, huh? Well, hopefully. Well, we'll see. <laughs> things are very interesting things are happening there's no question about it playing it close to the best uh, i love always, it always have to keep the cards close to the chest right you know what they right say on the baby right on hey uh william thanks again our guest again has been william ramsey of william ramsey investigates be sure to check out his website because i just told you he's got something good coming up. i kind of have a feeling it relates to something that we might have talked about, but I don't want to push him any further because be, he's, be. he's not saying it might be, it might be. But, well, uh, I, think, I think it'll go with the theme. There's things under the surface that, uh, you, you know, people might not be aware of, like Crowleyism or some of this other, these other kind of modern currents that are actually pretty dangerous. Very, very intriguing. William, as always, it's just so awesome talking to you and I uh, really appreciate what you're doing out there. And I appreciate you having this kind of open-ended conversation about yeah, anytime. Uh, Christianity. My pleasure. My pleasure. Great to talk with you, Alex. Take care. Thanks again to William Ramsey for joining me today on Skeptico. The one, the only question to tee up from this episode, primacy of Christianity, yes or no. This is a topic, particularly the Roman Josephus conspiratorial parapolitical part of this, that has really, really grabbed my attention. So I have a number of shows coming up on this. So if, if this at all interests you in the way that it interests me, then hey, you got some good content coming up. If not, you might be taking a little break from Skeptico for a while. But I do hope you stick around. Until then, do take care, and bye for now. <laughs>